we've already heard a wonderful introduction into the um, edition, online edition of the St. Petersburg manuscripts, um, which uh, were edited at um, the Center for the History of Women Philosophers and Scientists here in Paderborn. And we are very happy um, that um, Andrew Janiak is joining us from Duke University today. It's uh, one of the rare highlights of this, um, of this time um, that we can organize online events and have people join us from all over the world uh, without any travel complications. And we are hoping to make full use of this uh, wonderful um, event today online. And um, Andrew Janiak is... Um, a professor at Duke University in the US, as I've already said, and he's the co-leader of Project Vox, a project aimed at highlighting uh, the work of early modern women philosophers. And um, he's currently working on a multi-year project on Emily du Chatelet's philosophy and 18th century Newtonian thought in France, together with Professor Karen Detlefsen, He's a wonderful scholar and has lots and lots to say about Emily du Chatelet and has a very, very strong background in Newton and Newtonian physics at the time. And um, we, I think today he's going to talk about Emily du Chatelet's philosophical originality and um, give us um, some insight into why he thinks that she's in fact, an original thinker um, and what the premises are for this. Warm welcome to you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Um, I'm delighted to see you all. I'm sorry we can't be in person, but I agree it's lovely to have colleagues from around the world. I know people in now maybe three or four or five countries I can just see and probably more, so that's great. I hope you're all well. Um, can I share my screen? I have a PowerPoint. I think the host has to enable it so I can show my PowerPoint. Okay. I don't know what I'm doing. So you tell me if this works. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. I'm very bad at this. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so it's my pleasure to be part of this um, birthday party. I should have brought a birthday cake or something, but um, maybe later. So uh, it's going to be, as Clara said, a presentation on what I think is the originality of Du Chatelet's uh, work. And I will present, I think, 45 minutes, if that is that what you said? Clara, and then there'll be questions. Yes, that's promise good. not to go too long. Okay, great. Um, so here's the outline. Uh, I'm going to talk about how there have been since the 1730s and 1740s, and continuing until this day, a number of, I think, gendered readings of the Institution Physique, which have obscured its originality. And in order to show you the originality after talking about those gendered readings, I'm going to talk just briefly about Newton's theory of gravity. I think that's an important bit of background to the institution. And then some work that Du Châtelet did on essences and the principle of sufficient reason. And then I'll just conclude by talking about the originality of her project. Um, I don't think this crowd needs to hear this slide about the influence of Emily du Châtelet. Her work in the 1740s was circulated very widely throughout Europe and even beyond potentially. Uh, I think my current view is that she's the most famous woman working in philosophy in the entire enlightenment. If I'm wrong about that, someone can correct me, but that's my current opinion. As you probably know from great work done by others, uh, Kofi Malo and Glenn Rowe and others, uh, 
there are many entries in the Encyclopédie, the most famous text in the Enlightenment, of course, by Diderot d'Alembert, that involve long, long passages from the Institution, although never acknowledged. And that was from the um, work of Samuel Forgme. If you want to hear anything more about all of this, let me know in the Q&A. And this is my terrible attempt at a dynamic slide. Uh, so the, the big question for any interpreter of the institution, in my opinion, is the following. How do we understand the relationship between the early chapters, which are the institution or the foundations, or you could say the elements, which seem to involve metaphysics, and the later chapters, which seem to involve physics. The first chapters concern the principle of sufficient reason, the existence of God, essences, very classic metaphysical topics. And the later chapters are classic topics in physics, the inclined plane, attraction, gravity, motion, projectiles, forces, and so on. In between, of course, there are chapters that you could think of as the bridge between the two. Space, time, and matter could be talked about in metaphysics. They could be talked about in physics. But there's a real question, what does the first bunch of chapters have to do with the latter bunch of chapters? And I'll give you an answer to that today. My opinion is that she's actually an original thinker in this work in thinking about these institution of physics. And that has been obscured by a number of readings that began during her lifetime. And the general point would be that the thinkers in her milieu were constantly attempting to categorize her work as either Newtonian or Leibnizian or Wolfian or some, some other thing, they were really obsessed with saying that she was really just promulgating the ideas of some other more established male figure. And this continued after her lifetime. I think Voltaire does the same thing when he talks about um, her translation of Newton and then says she also wrote a, a book on the philosophy of Leibniz, uh, which I think is a serious mischaracterization of the institution. I don't have time to go into this, but this has continued um, into this day. And in fact, if you look at contemporary scholarship, even in the 21st century by um, people like Jonathan Israel, um, you will see these characterizations. Anthony Pagden, if you know who that is, very famous historians, writing in English at least, um, will have the same attitude. We need to talk about Du Châtelet as a Newtonian or a Leibnizian or a Wolfian. I think this led to a kind of bifurcation of the text because the sophisticated version of this reading says, well, look, clearly there's some kind of influence from Leibniz here and there's also some kind of influence from Newton. So then the way to think about things in a more sophisticated way is to say that the institution, the elements concerning metaphysics come from Leibniz and Wolf and the physics comes from Newton. And um, then you have, I think a more sophisticated version as I say, but it's really just another type of gendered reading where we're attempting to categorize the institution in some way using these pre-established categories. My opinion is this is not helpful and it obscures what's really going on in the text. For those of you who are interested in this, I can just say briefly, it also doesn't really make sense as soon as you really think about the text because if you just think about the physics in the text, um, sure there's discussions of Newton's theory of gravity Newtonian attraction and so on. But there's also a long discussion of vis viva, which is obviously not Newtonian physics. So that's just too simple. Even though it's a more sophisticated version, it's still too simple. 
Okay, I'm going to now just sketch a little bit why I think her uh, originality has been missed. And then I'm going to go into the details in sections two and three. So for the institution, I think um, in her milieu in France, amongst people who at least took Newton's physics very seriously, she was the only one who thought that physics required elements or institutions. Maupertuis in the discourse, as you may know, tries to argue that Cartesians are prejudiced against Newtonian attraction and they have dismissed it as a metaphysical absurdity. They should not do that. They should approach it as an empirical question. What Newton is saying about universal gravity. I'll talk about that more in a few minutes. Um, it's also very common for, for example, Voltaire or D'Alembert to say that to the extent that you need any metaphysics at all, it can be provided by Clark and Locke because Newton, of course, often eschewed metaphysical topics. This is definitely the view in the uh, preliminary discourse to the Encyclopédie. And so in her milieu, it's actually quite distinctive to say that we require institutions for physics, but they're definitely not going to come from Locke, as we will see. In fact, she's very critical of Locke's interpretation of Newton's view of gravity. But this is in a way more important. People have missed the fact that her understanding of physics is distinctive as well. So if you look at the chapters in the Institution, you'll see physics for her is the science of forces. And you might say, well, isn't that what Newton thought? Yes, in some ways, but so did Leibniz. And of course she revives the vis viva dispute. So there's no doubt that she thought about forces in a very broad way and should not be seen as a mere Newtonian. More importantly, if you look at her predecessors who she mentions, like Rouault and his Traité de Physique, or her contemporaries like Molière and uh, Christian Wolff, and there are many other examples, they all took uh, physics to be the general science of body. It's the general science that deals with body in all of its forms. I've given you some examples here. I don't know if you've ever looked at Wolff's uh, Deutsche Physik, for example, but like these other texts, he deals with an astonishing range of phenomena. You know, respiration, lightning, electricity, magnetism, minerals, salt, uh, the vortex theory of planetary motion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is true in all of these texts. Physics was really a general science dealing with all of nature. And as you see from the institution, just from the table of contents, that is not at all her view. And I think this is extremely important for understanding what's going on in this text. It's quite different to say that physics is the science of forces. And there's a focus on gravity because that's the force that has been understood the best by 1740. And there are suggestions that other forces, for example, dealing with electricity or magnetism or that kind of thing, will be dealt with in the future. Um, if I had a lot of time, I would tell you how the chapter on hypotheses in the institution helps to explain why she does not think of physics as the general science of body. Because as you might imagine, Rouault and Privat de Molière and Christian Wolff and many, many others hypothesized like crazy about all sorts of topics because of course they hadn't really been well understood yet. And Duchatelet is very clear on that. Okay, I already said uh, much of what's on here, but I will just say that um, there are people now who are wondering about her use of Wolf and whether some arguments she makes, for example, in chapter five about space is a Wolfian argument or is borrowed from Wolf. Um, I don't think this is helpful at all. As I've said, if you look at what Wolf thinks physics is, it's completely different than what Duchatelet thinks physics is. So calling her a Wolfian is unhelpful at best. I think it's also a legacy of these gendered readings where in fact, Wolf himself was trying to say originally 
that Du Chatelet was promoting his ideas in France. Later, he became disillusioned and said, oh, she's probably just a Newtonian. And so whether people are criticizing her or praising her, they're constantly trying to categorize her work in ways that I think are just not helpful and obscure what's going on in the text. Okay, that's the introduction. So now you say, okay, but what are the details of this? How does it really work in detail? So what I'm gonna to do today is just talk about a couple aspects of the text that illustrate my interpretation. I'll focus on, as you can see, the theory of gravity and questions about essences and the principle of sufficient reason. I think you could tell a similar story about the chapter on hypotheses, which I could tell in the Q and A if you want. And I think you could also tell a similar story about other chapters, but it would take all day to do that. So I'm just gonna focus on a few things. Okay. So um, I don't know how well this background is known. It probably is well known, but just to kind of remind us, um, I need to explain what the state of affairs was in physics when um, Du Chatelet was writing and thinking about these things in the 1730s. And there's an important legacy from Newton's Principia. And I wanna just talk about that briefly. So in a way, the main point I wanna make is that people like me in the past and many others have focused in, on the wrong thing in Newton. So we have focused um, a great deal about or on action at a distance, philosophical disputes raised by Newton's theory of gravity and so on. But I think there is a prior issue or in a way a more fundamental issue. And that is what does Newton's theory actually say? Well, here's what it literally says. So as you know, in book three of the Principia, where we're talking about the actual world not just any old motions that could be caused by forces, but the actual motions of bodies in this solar system and the forces that cause them, if we can infer that, we have a series of propositions that increase in generality until we get to this famous seventh proposition, which says the following, gravity is in all bodies universally. It's very hard to translate this actually, and it's hard to understand in the original, as you can see there. Some people think that's a good translation. Others have translated it uh, as follows. Gravity is effected in all bodies. Some have said gravity exists in all bodies. It's not clear exactly um, how to understand it. And I'll explain why in, in a little bit of depth, why it's hard to understand. How do I go to the next one? What did I do? Sorry. Okay, whoops. Here's one reason it's hard to understand. Newton has actually two conceptions of force, something that Euler and others thought was a real mistake. But in any case, Newton talked about both the vis impressa, the impressed force, which is what we now would call a Newtonian force. And he also talked about um, the vis inertiae, the force of inertia, which from a modern point of view is not a force at all, obviously. Um, but he had both of those throughout his life in all editions of the Principia, in the queries to the optics, et cetera. He never got rid of that. And in fact, the vis impressa was quite difficult to understand because in a way the vis inertiae was a lot more in line with the tradition. A vis is a kind of a power of a body, a property of a body, right? But if you look at how he understands an impressed force, you'll see it's not clear that that's right. So uh, definition four tells us that an impressed force is the action exerted on a body to change its state that I'm sure you're familiar with, but this force consists solely in the action. Okay, and does not remain in the body after the action has ceased. So since gravity is an impressed force, it is actually not clear at all that we should think of it as a power or a property, okay? It's an action, right? But it does not remain in the body. So it doesn't seem like an ordinary property. Okay, this already, when you couple it with proposition seven, 
raises questions about how to understand the idea that gravity is universal, right? So in the, in the most literal sense, he's saying there is this universal action exerted on all bodies, okay? And I would say one of the big problems for philosophers was to try to understand what that meant, uh, not just to defend it, not just to wonder about action at a distance or those sorts of things, but even to understand what does it mean? And my view is Du Chatelet is particularly interested in that issue. So we'll get to that later. Now, I just wanna point out that this confusion about what does Newton mean concerning universal gravity can't be easily solved by just looking at other textual evidence. I don't think it's clear even from private correspondence or from manuscripts what Newton meant by this. So if you look, for example, here, then the famous letter to Richard Bentley, who was going to be a proponent of Newtonian ideas, right? So this is a friendly audience. Newton, I think, is still not clear even in private to a friendly interlocutor about this issue. So he says, I would not want you to ascribe to me the idea that gravity is innate. And then he says that gravity should be innate, inherent, and essential to matter. Forget about the clause for a second. Uh, is an absurdity. Okay? But the problem is, he never says what he means by innate, inherent, or essential, even in this private text, even to a friendly interlocutor. Now, maybe they all are just synonyms and they mean the same thing. We're not sure. I pick out this letter to Bentley because it is, as you will see, directly connected to a more public question about gravity as well. But as we'll see, the confusion continues in public. So, as you know, Newton, of course, was heavily criticized by people, especially on the continent, who did not like the idea of universal gravity. Christian Huygens, sorry for my Dutch pronunciation, uh, did not accept the idea of universal gravity. He thought we needed an intelligible cause, and Newton had not provided one. That was in 1690 already. Leibniz's criticisms are all very well known. And so in 1713, with the second edition of the Principia, and then in the third edition, we get these reguli philosophandi, these famous rules that are supposed to undergird Newton's theory of universal gravity. I've given you the famous and important clause of rule three. This brings together all the things I've mentioned so far. Right. So he says that all bodies gravitate toward one another. That's quite a literal translation, which, by the way, sounds like an action. If you think about it, gravitating could be an action. OK, but then the caveats are very important. Newton says, I am by no means affirming that gravity is essential to matter. That's that term back from Bentley. But we don't know what it means by inherent force. I mean, only the vis inertiae. That's confusing, of course, because that's a different kind of force, if it is one at all, than gravity. This is immutable. Gravity, however, is diminished as bodies recede from the Earth. Rule three was supposed to defend the claim, as you can see here, for universal gravity. But my opinion is, Du Chatelet understood that the problem is actually different. Namely, it doesn't clarify what it means to say that gravity is universal. It simply says we have an empirical basis for a kind of inference that we make with other features of bodies. But as we've seen from before, when we remember that gravity is a vis impressa, it's not clear that you can think of it as a property. And so when you put it here amongst a bunch of other properties like impenetrability, it's rather confusing. Now, as you probably know, the second edition was edited by Roger Coates, who became one of the most important Newtonians, although he lived a very short life. In one of the very rare moments when Newton was a kind of um, emotionally sensitive uh, and generous interpreter, he said, if Coates had lived longer, we might have learned something. That was uh, 
high praise from Newton. Anyway, Coates decided that he had to tackle this issue in what became a famous editor's preface to the second edition of 1713. He decided it wasn't clear what Newton was saying about universal gravity. And so what he said is, well, we should really think of gravity as one of the primary qualities of bodies. So it wasn't accidental to talk about gravity in rule three, along with things like impenetrability, because in fact, Coates thinks gravity is just like impenetrability. It's a primary quality. Now, you probably know Newton never said that, even in the third edition, not in private, not in public. This is Coates attempting to clarify the notion of universal gravity. However, in my view, it didn't really clarify matters. Here's why. Coates makes this claim that gravity is a primary quality, but his primary goal in the preface to the second edition is to provide evidence that gravity is universal. And to say that our evidence that gravity is universal from astronomical observations from earlier work by Galileo and so on is at least as good as our evidence, for example, that you know, the moon is impenetrable or all bodies in the universe are impenetrable or extended, et cetera. So Coates says, we have the same kind of empirical evidence to claim that gravity is universal as we do to claim that these other qualities are universal. I think this ignores a very important fact that I've mentioned before, namely, well, leaving aside the evidence, in what sense can you think of gravity as a quality at all, given that it is a vis impressa, an action? Impenetrability, extension, and so on do not seem like they're that kind of thing. This, I submit to you, is a classic metaphysical question. What are the qualities of body? How do they differ? Are there different types of qualities? Right? It's one of the classic questions of 17th century metaphysics. And my view is Coates and Newton avoid this question. Secondly, we still don't know what it would mean to say that gravity is essential to matter. We only know, first, Newton said, I am not claiming that it's essential to matter without saying what that would mean. And second, Coates simply says that gravity is a primary quality without saying that that means that it's essential to matter. Maybe it, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. It depends what you think about primary qualities. So in the end, I think, um, the legacy of Newton's theory is something like this. We have been told that gravity is in all bodies or maybe belongs to all bodies or maybe is affected in all bodies or maybe is a primary quality of all bodies or maybe is an action exerted on all bodies. But we don't know which one of these is the right understanding of Newton's theory. We don't know that these are supposed to be equivalent. They certainly don't seem to be equivalent. We don't know what the right one is. And this was the state of affairs actually when Newton died in 1727. We also would say, we know that gravity is claimed to be universal and that we have sufficient empirical evidence to say that it's universal. We also know that Newton is saying, I am not claiming it's essential to matter but we don't know what it would mean to say that gravity is essential to matter. If you're going to deny something, it'd be helpful to know what it is that you're denying. That's the state of affairs when uh, Madame de Chatelet comes on the scene, in my view, and starts learning about these things and studying them. And I think that this is a nice way of illustrating what's original about the institution. So I'm now going to try to um, tell you a little bit about, about that. As I said before, this is just uh, an example of this interpretation. I think we could also talk about chapter four, which is on hypotheses. In some ways, the chapters on space and time can be understood this way too, although they raise some other very interesting issues. I do think, however, that all of them 
really should not be understood through the classic lens where you ask, is it Newtonian? Is it Wolfian? Is it Leibnizian? I think it is um, unwise to ask those questions as I've already said. Okay, so right off the bat in, sorry, that's a um, strange American phrase, I guess, or maybe it's British from cricket, I'm not sure. Um, someone can tell us later. Right at the beginning, um, Du Chatelet says something that's rather surprising in a way. So we're in chapter three. We're talking about essences, attributes, and modes. These are obviously metaphysical topics, classic metaphysical topics. They don't seem to have anything to do with things like the inclined plane or the pendulum, which are obviously classic issues in physics. And yet she says, I'm sorry, I forgot to translate this, but um, maybe everyone can read it. Um, she says that talking about essences is very important because it, it concerns the most important truths of metaphysics. Well, that we would expect, but also many truths in physics, which we would not expect. My view is this is actually a very insightful comment because as we have seen, at the time she was writing her text, this was exactly one of the major issues in understanding the most successful scientific theory in the early enlightenment. Newton's theory of gravity should be understand, understood in this way. Namely, we have to figure out what it would mean to say that gravity is essential to matter. After all, if Newton says, look, all bodies gravitate or have gravity or exert a force or are affected in a certain way, et cetera, it sounds like Newton is saying matter as such involves gravity or gravitates or exerts a force, et cetera. If he's saying matter as such is like that, then it certainly seems like he's saying gravity is essential to matter. But he himself had claimed he is not saying that. So we need to get clear on what would it mean to say that gravity is essential to matter in the first place. In my view, none of the other French uh, Lumière like Maupertuis understood this point or clarified it. That becomes Du Châtelet's task at the beginning of the text. She points out that there are a number of different notions of uh, essences that have to be distinguished. Now, again, this is classic metaphysics, but as we'll see, it's very important for understanding physics as well. First of all, you remember what Newton said to Bentley, right? And the inherent and so on. That sounds like the first idea, namely that an, an essential property is an intrinsic property or a non-relational property, right? As you all know, one of the famous arguments about primary qualities involve the so-called lonely corpuscle, right? So you have a single particle. You imagine that it exists with nothing else and you ask, well, what features would that particle have, right? Well, it wouldn't be to the left of anything. It wouldn't be taller than anything, but it would be extended, for example. Well, would it have gravity or not would be the question in this case. Um, if so, then you could think of it as essential in the sense of being an intrinsic or non-relational feature. However, there are other notions of essences. For example, number two, this actually comes uh, up in a correspondence that Clark had with Coates. And I won't go into detail, but Coates thought about essences in much the way that Descartes thought about an essential attribute. It's a much stronger idea than one, namely, something's essential to a body in just in case all of its properties depend on that, right? So think of the mind and thought. You can have ideas because you have the essential attribute of thought. If you didn't, you wouldn't have those features. That's a stronger notion. The third notion is back to the issue of whether matter as such gravitates. That could be thought of as determining the kind, right? To be a material thing is to gravitate. So if you don't gravitate, you're not a material thing. Certainly a lot of people thought that was true of extension and maybe impenetrability or solidity in Locke. 
So as you can see, there are multiple notions of essences and you have to distinguish them, which is not something you find in Newton or Coates or his other uh, followers. Okay. So now we apply this to Newton's theory of gravity. And we have to clarify whether we mean the first, the second, or the third notion when we are asking whether gravity is essential to matter. All of this is clarified in chapter three, and that helps to set up the discussion of physics later in the Institution. I don't need to go into this. You can, I think, uh, make sense of it. Um, and you can see that if I say that an essential property is intrinsic, right? Like for example, my height might be intrinsic. Clearly that does not mean that it tells you what kind of thing I am, right? And it certainly wouldn't be an essential attribute. My height changes over time as I grow older. First you get taller, then apparently you get a little shorter as gravity shrinks your spine, that kind of thing, right? So these notions come apart and distinguish to them is therefore very important. Okay, so how does she apply this? Well, for the um, kind sense of essence, Duchatelet makes it very clear early in the text, but also later in chapter 15, that Newton has not shown that gravity is essential to matter in this sense. The reason is, and this is a very famous point that uh, Newton was well aware of, the reason is that Newton did not show that there is no ether or other medium that is relevant for gravitational interactions. As you probably know, he in fact speculated about that himself. That means it could very well be that everything in our universe gravitates because there's a certain medium, right? Just like people thought maybe there's a medium for light, might be similar, such that if you were to take away the medium, you would take away gravitation. Well, then in that sense, you wouldn't think that it's uh, essential to matter in this notion, right? According to this notion, because you wouldn't say, if I took away the ether, I no longer have matter. That would be a very strange idea. So that's the first answer. If you mean uh, the kind sense for essences, Newton has not shown that gravity is essential to matter. But what if you don't mean that? What if you have in mind the sense of something being intrinsic? That's certainly one way of thinking about basic properties of matter like extension, right? If I take away everything else in the universe, my table would still be extended, et cetera. She also handles that question and she argues that um, it cannot be essential in this sense either because gravity depends on spatial separation, right? In other words, one body gravitates toward another depending on how uh, it is with a certain strength, depending on how close they are or how far apart. Now, as you might recall, in, reg in the Reguli, in rule three, Newton says, I am not claiming that gravity is essential to matter. Only mass is essential, or what he called the vis inertiae. Gravity diminishes as bodies recede from the earth. That's all he said. Now that might mean he was thinking of an essential feature in this sense, namely it's intrinsic, but we don't know. He never clarifies that and neither does Coates. So Duchatelet clarifies it for her readers. Okay. Now, that's not all. Uh, and now we make a transition to the other thing I wanna talk about, which is the principle of sufficient reason. So she was well aware that many Newtonians were too smart to claim that gravity is essential to matter. And she knew that Newton himself was afraid that this would lead to a philosophical dispute. And so he said, I am not claiming this. Okay. So what if we say instead that gravity is a power of bodies or a property, but not an essential property? then I can forget about all this stuff we've been talking about so far. Well, as it turns out, she deals with that as well. And she actually points out something I think is very important and distinguishes her from others in her milieu 
and also in particular people who thought Locke had the right view, as we'll see in a minute. So she says, look, gravity is not the kind of thing that can easily be construed as a power or a property at all, whether essential or non-essential. It's got this very strange feature to it. Namely, it's dependent not only on spatial separation, but also on the intrinsic feature, namely mass, of the two bodies that are gravitating toward each other. So if I imagine a lonely corpuscle, or let's say a rock, and I ask, well, does this rock have the power to attract? You say, well, yeah, it does in the sense that if anything else were to exist, it would attract that thing. Well, that's not so easy to understand because that will depend on the intrinsic feature of the other thing, the mass. And if I have uh, a moon suddenly accompany the rock, then the rock will, will not attract the moon. The moon will attract the rock. Now, I don't say this is any kind of definitive argument. I simply think her view is it's very difficult to construe gravity as a property for these reasons. And so we shouldn't think that it's obvious that the way to avoid all the problems with essences is just to say, well, gravity is a property, but a non-essential one. And the reason she talks about this is because many people like D'Alembert in the preliminary discourse, uh, like Voltaire and others thought Locke's view or version of metaphysics should be used to supplements, supplement Newton's less metaphysical approach to nature. But Du Chatelet was very critical of Locke's view. And as you probably know, that comes up in the Stilling Fleet correspondence, which was extremely famous, where Locke says, essentially, look, Newton convinces me that God has super added gravity to matter. I do not understand how this can be, how matter can gravitate toward under other matter. I simply know that it does because Newton proved that. And so the best way to understand it is to say that God super added it, right? What that means is it's not part of the essence of matter, but it's added on top of that through divine fiat. Here is where the PSR, the principle of sufficient reason, comes to the rescue. Chatelet thinks this view of Locke's is a serious mistake. First of all, as Locke himself admits, what the thesis really means is that we don't understand gravity at all. We simply think it's a kind of fact of nature uh, established by divine fiat. But that gives us no insight into how it is that bodies gravitate toward each other. Okay. She thinks, look, um, the demand for understanding expressed in the principle of sufficient reason should make us very wary of this thesis to begin with. This is not a helpful supplement from Locke to Newton's physics. In fact, it just doesn't clarify things at all. Okay. Trying not to go uh, over. Um, okay, I'm going to get to the last section in just a minute. Um, but what I would say there as well, um, and I can talk about this in the Q&A, is that Duchatelet is quite aware that, in fact, one problem with Locke is that he assumes that gravity is a property of bodies, right? And then simply says, well, it's not essential, it's super added by divine fiat. And yet, as we have seen, she is giving you reasons to be doubtful of the idea that gravity is a property at all. And that goes back to the heart of Newtonian physics, namely, if you're talking about an impressed force, it's not clear that it's proper to think of that as a property in the first place. We can talk about that more in the Q&A. Okay, so how does this illustrate the originality of her project? As you can see, I'm showing you there the famous German translation. And um, people in Paderborn know a lot more about that than I do. Okay, so this is going to be rather short, but um, I'll tell you what I think 
the right way to read the Institution is, given these points, I think we should understand her to be saying the following thing. The elements of physics, the Institution, for example, the discussion of essences, the discussion of properties, the discussion of the principle of sufficient reason, they clarify the physics and help to explicate the physics that occurs in the later chapters. I don't think it's really helpful to, to believe that they are metaphysical foundations for the physics, because in my view, that obscures the fact that she is thinking of them as clarifying what the physics is telling us about nature in the first place. And as I've tried to show today, Newton's physics is not clear. In fact, if you take Proposition 7 of Book 3, which in a way is the most famous conclusion of the entire Principia, we really don't know what it means as of 1730. And she's trying to say, we need to broach metaphysical topics that were ignored by Coates and Newton at their peril in order to clarify what universal gravity does and does not mean. That's kind of the key. Okay, now how do gendered ha uh, readings hamper this? Well, I think um, the attempt to show that she is a Newtonian or a Leibnizian or a Wolfian uh, leads people astray and that really doesn't enable them to understand what is uh, original about this clarification notion that I've been talking about. Also, I think it leads them to, for example, ignore parts of the text. So the simplest example would be, if you think that her physics is Newtonian, then of course you're gonna ignore the vis viva chapter. But vis viva was very important to her. And that is, is really a uh, misinterpretation. And so, in my view, we ought to think of physics in Du Chatelet's hands as the science of forces, whether we're talking about gravity or dead force or living force. And the job of a philosopher like her is to clarify what physics has and has not understood so far about the forces of nature. That also distinguishes uh, her, I think, from um, many of the people in her milieu, okay? And the reason is, as I said, they do not think of physics as restricted to the forces of nature. They think of physics as a much broader general science dealing with body in general. And as a result, they discuss an enormous range of phenomena, things that we would consider to be part of biology, chemistry, geology, even physiology, all in the same text. That is, for example, Christian Wolff's view. It's also the view of many Cartesians, etc. That is not Du Chatelet's view. And I think if I had another hour, I would try to say how the chapter on hypotheses helps to explain why that isn't her view. Namely, she thinks when you talk about hypothetical reasoning, it needs to be highly constrained and if you take physics to be the general science of body, you will break through those constraints and you will engage in lots of hypothetical reasoning. And she thinks that, of course, is uh, not justified. Okay. This is my last slide, which is a little crazy, I realize. Um, but this is just a way of going back to where we started. So I want to just note um, that there is a kind of unity to the text that expresses her originality. The text seems to be disjoint because it's hard to see how the existence of God or a discussion of essences has anything to do with the inclined plane or the, mo the motion of a projectile. But as I've tried to show with one or two detailed examples, in fact, these early um, chapters, which are the elements you need the institution that you need help to clarify what is being said by the best physical theory in, in, in that day. 
And I've talked about the principle of sufficient reason and essences. As I say, I think you can do the same thing with hypotheses. And uh, my task in the next year or two is to fill in more details and think about space and time and motion as well. I think those can be treated in similar ways. So the conclusion is that um, Du Chatelet had a distinctive view and it has been, I think, unfortunately ignored by uh, um, many figures beginning in her own day, but continuing all the way um, until today. And so I'm hoping that we will forget about these old questions of how to categorize her and instead just read the text on its own terms and see what a fascinating uh, philosophical text it really is. So thank you. I hope I didn't go over time. I don't know how to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can take it back. Did that do it? Oh, yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Perfect. Yes, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much, Andrew.